shall we start? Yes, okay. So today we are going to continue our journey in seismic data processing. We are going to speak today about correlation and deconvolution and we will finish our today talk with an introduction to discretization of seismic time series or seismic traces. Today's agenda will be correlation of seismic signals. We are going to speak about the definition of correlation and also the important usage of correlation. Then we are going to move to deconvolution and see with uh, some example or examples how deconvolution helps to fulfill the goal of our course which is to enhance the signal to the noise ratio. You know, as we said in the start of this course, our intention is to enhance signal to noise ratio so that we can define seismic reflection energy clearly and then we can use this clear image to model the subsurface and define structures and depths to interfaces of subsurface. Then we are going to give some introduction, small introduction about the sampling or discretization of seismic signals. As we said before, seismic signal when recorded by our instrument it is originally continuous signal, the geophone converts the mechanical energy or mechanical vibration of the earth into electrical signal using, say, electromagnetic phenomena or uh, piezoelectric phenomena, any mean we can use to convert mechanical energy to electric signal, then the electric signal is transferred to the recording unit where it is digitized and then sent to storage device. So the, the third part is intentionally and uh, will, will focus mainly on the, this step digitizing or discretizing this electric signal and transferring it to some useful information that can be used with modern computers. Now, we are going to speak about correlation of seismic signals. Actually, we have two types of correlations. We have cross correlations and we have also autocorrelation. Cross correlation is a statistical measure used to compare two signals. I have two seismic signals or any two signals and I want to compare these two signals as a function of time shift or time lag between these two signals. The autocorrelation is a special case of correlation where the signal is compared with itself. So I'm taking the signal and the compare. Correlation means compare could be some, something with other thing. So here I'm comparing the original 
signal with itself also for a variety of time shift or time lags and is particularly useful for detecting repeated periods within signal in the presence of noise. So, as we, we said before, we have in, in real world, we don't have the ideal case. The ideal case is that I have the source and I have reflection coefficients, then I got a clean seismic section. This doesn't happen in, 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 in reality. In reality, I have noise, and there are many sources of noises. So, I need autocorrelation to define or to detect repeating periods within signals in the presence of noise. The autocorrelation function is often normalized. Normalized mean to make the maximum value equal to one. So if I'm normalizing something, I am uh, actually uh, subdividing or dividing by the maximum value of this array something or this, uh, this vector. So that the maximum value will be unity at zero leg. So, we have here an example of the autocorrelation. We have two similar traces here, as you see, this one and this one. These traces are similar, and these traces are autocorrelated. Here is, a zero, here is the zero leg and then as you see we have repetition here okay this the original data original phase and this is a repetition so this repetition is dangerous to our seismic work because sometimes this repetition may give false indications to us about the subsurface structure. To clarify this point, we are going to see this example. This example, we can see from this cross section, and I hope the, the feature is clear for you. You see this structure, see this? As repeated here, and also repeated here. In seismic, we call this repetition or multiple. Multiples means we have multiple reflection at the same interface. So I have multiple energy coming from the same reflectors. It's logic to have the same feature, the same structure. It's the same uh, interface and the, it's uh, later reflections coming or multiple reflection coming from the same river, uh, the same interface. So it's uh, logic to have the structure looks the same. So please. Wake up, wake up. Okay. So, suppose I'm, I, I, I didn't take care of this feature and work on this interface and driving that I have another structure at deeper uh, depths and then go to uh, to logging and then there is no such a structure. Another uh, dangerous effect of this multiples, it may hide the actual data. It may mask, you know mask? Mask, uh, it's, uh, it's famous here, we're masking for 
carnivals, I put something on your face and so on. Mask. Yes? Like uh, in Egypt, uh, the vendetta mask become famous after uh, the accident uh, there. So, these reflections, multiple reflections, mask or hide the actual data. So, my intention first is to define that these are actually multiples, not original data, and then to find a mean or something, some tool to remove such effect. Here we have example of cross-correlation. This is a movie from YouTube using MATLAB. Now, this is a cross-correlation between two functions, the red one and the blue one. This represents the result of cross-correlation between these two functions. This one, it's flipped. So this one, you should know what, what this, this, what is this called? What's the name of this process? Convolution. It, it was just yesterday. So this one is a convolution. So this is a comparison between cross correlation and convolution. Do you have any question? Excuse me? The previous slide, uh, uh, what, why is yeah, it different between picture 3 and 4? Different? You, you mean why these two curves are different? Yes, because here in, in cross correlation, we did not flip the function. Okay? The function here is not flipped, it's the shifted function. But in convolution, the red function is flipped. Flip means mirror image. Okay? So this one is flipped. Is it clear? Okay, as we are working actually with discrete samples, we are working with uh, time series, which means amplitudes uh, versus time. So we are going to restrict ourselves in, in forthcoming equations on the discrete formula or the formula for discrete data. For autocorrelation, the function is phi subscript k as a function of x equal 1 divided by n summation from n equal 0 to n minus k minus 1. The function or the series x of n times the function x of n plus k, where k here represents the shifting. Okay, is the, is the argument for shifting of the function, where k takes the value from 0 to n minus 1. The cross-correlation function is nearly the same, except that we replaced the x, the second function, x of n plus k, by another function, other than the original one, y of x plus k. We have to, to state that both autocorrelation and cross-correlation are vital for seismic data processing. We will have later on this uh, lecture uh, some um, important uh, feature. We can briefly state that one autocorrelation can be used to determine the repetition 
of a signal and thus help to in determining multiples. Two, cross correlation determines the similarity between two seismic signals. Thus, can be used to deconvol uh, with the convolution. Sorry, there is two is, uh, uh, is extra used with the convolution to remove multiples and source wavelet. At this point, we we have to point out that as the wavelet, the source wavelet becomes wider, our resolution of the subsurface becomes poor. Poor because I have wider wavelet. Okay? As the wavelet becomes narrow, then the resolution of the subsurface becomes better and higher. So one of our goal or one of our goals in seismic data processing is to remove this, wi this widening and source wavelet and apply certain filter to remove the wavelet and return the, 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 the seismic source into uh, nearer to seismic, to delta function, so, sorry, to delta function. You remember delta function? We we'll give an idea about it. Delta function is a spike. We have this delta function, which is a spike. Zeros at all points except at t equal zero. At this point, the function equal one. Okay. The Fourier transform of delta function is white spectrum. We call this white spectrum. Meaning that we have contribution, or we have nearly the energy is the same for all frequencies. Having such a spectrum means that my source can give me good image about all the data in the subsurface, whether it is small in dimension or it is or is it uh, huge in dimension? Do you uh, have any idea about the so-called uh, Fresnel uh, zone? Fresnel? Okay. Do you know? Do you know something about Fresnel? You didn't? Never? Why? Because you know Fresnel zone determines the smallest feature that can be identified by our experiment, by our seismic experiment. Okay. Uh, FYI, not FYB, FYI, which means for your information. Okay. Fresnel zone determines the smallest feature that can be represented by our seismic signal. We are following the relation frequency equal. Uh, velocity times wavelength. Okay? So, this is the frequency of the signal and this is the velocity, the wave speed. The wave, the speed, the wave propagate in the, in, the, in the layer and lambda is its wavelength. 
assuming we have chromot chromot uh, chromo chromatic uh, uh, monochromatic uh, ray. We're having single frequency. So Fresnel states that any features greater than one fourth of the wavelengths can be identified by our experiment. All features with dimension less than one fourth of the wavelength cannot be identified. You, I, 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 I'm, I'm sure you should have studied this before. You, you don't, you don't know uh, blind zone. Blind zone. Blind layer. Bli no, no, not blind here. Not. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you have layers. You have layers here, and suppose you have three small la thin, thin layer here. This thin layer, if it doesn't meet Fresnel hypothesis, it will not be seen. It's blind for, for us. We will not see it. Seismic experiment will not see it. So blind zone is related to Fresnel. Excuse me? I, I need you, you to, to pop up your volume. Tuning? Tuning, yes. Tuning what? Technique? Tuning? T? I? T I? H? T H? Write it. <laughs> yeah, you mean thickness. Okay. No, actually, this uh, this term terminology may be new for me. What 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 do you mean by tuning uh, <laughs> thickness? Okay. Okay, so I'll have discussion later. Now we move to deconvolution. Deconvolution is the reverse of convolution. So if we in convolution we are blending functions together, so deconvolution is to separate this yeah. function separate by filtration by any, any anything else and you, you return back to have uh, apple uh, alone and strawberry alone which is difficult okay it's used to remove the effect of source from seismic data the convolution is divi is division in the frequency domain as convolution is a multiplication in the frequency domain Deconvolution is a division in the frequency domain. The deconvolution of a sequence or time series A, or sorry, for a frequency here, it's frequency series A, from the sequence C in the frequency domain, given by, here is B of F in frequencies, equal the signal C divided by the signal A. So, this, uh, as, we, as we move in our course, we determine or realize how important it is Fourier transform to our work. Because it's very simple to, to apply deconvolution here in frequency domain than in 
frequency domain, especially with large number of samples. This is an example of synthetic seismogram showing both convolution and deconvolution. Uh, may I have your attention? In convolution, we start by the source, and this source is Ricker wavelet, and then we build up the media, the reflection coefficient of the media, like this one. So this is an interface, and this another one, another one, and so on. Convolving the source with the media gives the record that we actually record or should record in our seismic experiment. So we call this synthetic seismogram or synthetic trace. So synthetic means it's not the true one. It's one I create. Okay? Deconvolution, on the other hand, is a way to remove the effect of the source. So here we, we removed the effect of the source. But we applied number of wave water level. This one is 10. Water level is 10 decibel. This is 20 and this is 30. So the question here is what, I what, what is water level? Anyone if you have any idea about what is water level? No. No, not water, not sea level. No, okay. Uh, here, if you are going to subdivide, now the convolution is a subdivision. Okay? So you are subdividing signal, say, like this. Was another one. Okay, this is any two artificial signals. Can you tell me what is the problem that could arise if I subdivide these two signals? Uh, subdivide this signal by this one. You have any idea? Yes, both are frequencies. Different, no, 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 we, it's, we are, we have two time series, we have two frequency series and we are dividing at two samples or two values at the same frequency. The problem is, as you see here, this signal equal zero at some points, okay? So if you divide by zero, you will have error in your software because it's not permitted to divide by zero. So we apply something called water level. Water level is something like that. That I'm saying that <laughs> this value will be the minimum value for the signal. So that I never end up with division with zero. Okay? Never end up with the division of zero. So here, these examples show you the effect of such water level. Water level must be 
chosen very carefully because it might obscure or remove important data or some artificial data may leak into my data. So I must take care when working with this. So the example here shows convolution with number of water level. So this one, this water level concept is very important for you to, to remember, even in, if in mathematics or so. So you, if you have something, some uh, uh, applications where you are, you are going to, de to divide something by, or some array with other array, you have to put in, into your mind that if there is zero, you have to put water level or you add certain value to, so that to remove these zero values, okay? So this show you the effect of water level. As water level increase, many of the information is suppressed. Okay. It is assumed that these traces correspond to this one, which is the, the, the one for belonging to the Earth's structure. Now we are going to have another discussion about deconvolution. Uh, deconvolution is the undoing convolution. It's used for spiking or whitening. Uh, it's called spiking or whitening deconvolution. Whitening comes from here. It's whitening the spectrum or spiking in time domain. So, in this example, we are going to, to use deconvolution to remove the effect of the wavelet of the source and to try to, try to uh, have the, uh, to try to have the spike effect of the source. And also, uh, we'll begin with the uh, Example that will remove the later arrival from the phase. Uh, here in this discussion, the software is a convolution between the reflectivity and the source. And then the deconvolution filter used is uh, deconvolution, which is uh, D, is the convolution with the seismogram itself that it will reduce the effect of wavelet to delta function so that we get the reflectivity uh, of, the, of the earth. Time variant deconvolution, uh, as you know, D changes with time to account for different frequency content of energy that has traveled greater, greater distances. I think yesterday we, 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 we said that, or we understand that, earth act as low bus filter. So as waves move greater distances, it's a frequency content a change. It's a frequency content becomes more in the lower frequency content or lower frequency band, and most and or much of the frequency content is reduced. So the time invariant deconvolution is working on, on, on a trial to remove such effect. It's uh, like reverse filtering. The Earth filtered this energy and we are trying to retrieve the uh, uh, filtered data. Also, uh, the, the, the third type of deconvolution is a predictive deconvolution. So we have three types, spiking, time variant, and predictive one. The predictive deconvolution is used mainly to remove the multiples. Okay, in this example, we are going to speak about the spiking. You know, this is a wave, the signal that is recorded, arrived at the geophone, and this is the filter, and this is our desired uh, look of the signal. You know, 
the, the system, like say the mechanical system, when it, it's hit by something, the, the energy hit by this system by a force, this uh, system shifts from its place and then it returns to equilibrium position, but there, it keeps inside restoration force. So it moves in the opposite direction and then return and so on. This one, like the pendulum. The pendulum, you move, you, you shift the mass and then the mass start swings. So the mass starts swings and then decaying until it, re it returns back to its equilibrium position at certain time. But in this time, some data may arrive. And also, this, fe this feature may cause masking, as we said, for uh, our seismic trees. So the intention of spiking deconvolution is to apply certain filter to remove the later phases or the later arrivals of this signal. So we design this filter and then we are going to apply the, the filter, which is the reverse filter, on this signal to arrive to that one. Here we uh, design we, we, are, we suppose we have this uh, wavelet, this one, it's one minus one, uh, three uh, quarter and uh, minus half. So we design this uh, deconvolution operation and then we apply shifting. As a first step, these are, are zeros and these are zeros. So here we have zero and one. This is the first point. Then shifting another step, the result is also zero. So this is the first phase we, 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 would, we would like to have. This is a spike where, where we are looking for. Now, with consecutive shifting, you see the values become zero and so on until the finish. So, we moved from the original signal to spike signal using the deconvolution or spiking deconvolution operator. Okay, this is another important use of deconvolution, which is the source pulse deconvolution. So this one is the pulse, as you see in, in the upper uh, cross section, some of the feature is, is hidden or not clear, but when we apply deconvolution and we arrive at this one as a source for the source, as you see we have the picture is clearer. Look here and look here, the, the picture here is clear, much clearer. Also, here is a situation for original section. Much of the data is retrieved at the shallow uh, depths or uh, at near uh, time. And then also features at deeper time becomes more visible, applying the deconvolution uh, to seismic, seg uh, seismic uh, section where ringing or multiples are also removed. This is another type of uh, deconvolution using uh, correlation, especially uh, cross-correlation. We are going to use uh, or we are using this to remove the effect of, uh, of say, uh, multiples and noise. So uh, if the source pulse is known to us, then cross-correlating it with the recorded wave form gets us uh, back or closer to reflectivity function. 
Okay, so it, 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 defines, it defines where the similarity between the, the source wavelet and the function or the, 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 the signal, the, the seismogram recorded. And this similarity is, re, is related to the, these two, uh, the source here and the source in, in its clear form and the source which is convolved with the synthetic or with the observed seismogram. So cross correlation in this case will retrieve where the reflection occurs. So if we don't know the source pulse, autocorrelation can help me in this uh, case. And it gives me the multiples. And then I can use cross correlation and autocorrelation with deconvolution to remove such unwanted signal. Now we're going to end our discussion with an introduction to seismic series discretization. This is a very important task in our study. And uh, uh, I guess maybe you, you don't have enough information uh, in this. Um, so I'm going to start here by some definition. And uh, tomorrow we'll get more about discretization of seismic signal. So we have four points that we are going to cover swift, swiftly today. This one, definition of what is sample rate, what is sample interval, and this one is Nyquist frequency, what it stands for, and finally, what is aliasing and what's an anti-alias filter. Sample rate means the number of samples per unit time. Usually, we, we take unit time as one second. So uh, sometimes we say we have 100 samples per second, with me, which means I have, in one second, I have one sample. This is called sample rate. OK? The second point is a sample interval. The sample interval is the time between two successive points or two successive discretes or two successive measurements. The idea is that I have here the seismic signal. This seismic signal is introduced to analog to digital converter, ADC. Analog to digital converter looks like a gate. It opens every uh, certain uh, interval time, say every one millisecond. So every one millisecond, this gate is opened. And then the, it reads the volt okay the potential of the of this signal so this signal ends up with points here with v1 v2 v3 v4 and so on this sample interval is the time between two opening of the gate okay like in games, you play games it's a, where a monster opened the, the gate to, 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 kill, uh, to kill you. And, uh, so you try to measure the, 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 the sample interval and try to, to move fast, uh, not to be hit by this uh, monster. So, and then the output here is a time series. The time series may be recorded as in volts or may be recorded in counts. Counts. So each instrument put some counts for each, may say, say it is uh, uh, 500 counts per volt. So C per V. So I, it will change the volt into counts. So after recording, if we are going to use amplitude, we, we have to 
remove the effect of the instrument and analog to digital converter and returning to either displacement or velocity or acceleration. Okay. Uh, as I told you, you are going to speak more about this subject. Nyquist frequency is defined as the maximum frequency that can be represented by discrete time series. If I have something like this, so it is accepted or observed that to record this uh, cycle, I have, this is the zero, so I have this point, and this point, and this point. So I have three points. So Nyquist frequency is defined as equal to one divided by two delta t with the interval delta is the uh, sample interval. So in discretization, in digitizing the, the signal, I have to, to, ke to keep into, uh, in my mind that if I'm using, for example, one, 100 sample, sample per second, so the interval becomes nearly 0.01 second, thus it's 1 over 2 times, it's 100 over 2, which is mean we have the maximum frequency that can be represented <coughs> by our, our signal, which our, the, the Nyquist frequency here is 50 hertz. So, what if my signal, you know, the, the Earth, the, 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 the waveform, the signal, is not ending at 15, uh, 50 hertz. It, it may reach uh, hundreds of, uh, of, uh, of hertz. Okay? So, what if, what, what happens to frequencies greater than 50 hertz? What happens? It will misrepresent it. It will not represent it in good condition, misrepresented, causing the so called aliasing. Aliasing means that, as a, a clear example of aliasing, my eye is taking shots every, I think, I, I think it's uh, 16 times a second. And these shots, okay is then taken to, to, the, to the brain and then animated. So I can see you moving and so on. So I, I observe this. Uh, in our life, more, most of the phenomena we, 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 we see is, is moving or is repeating itself at less than this value, which is 16 sample per second or 16 shot per second. But suppose something moved in front of my eye between any two successive, uh, successive shots. I will not see it. Okay? I will not see it. So when we say we were speaking about uh, the, uh, the unknown Zareb, and, uh, so we, 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 we do not. We, this unknown, this is not seen by our own uh, uh, eyes and, uh, for example, our ears, uh, uh, touch, uh, so on, or smells. So, uh, concentrating on, on, on eyes, so many things happens in front of, of us, but we, do, we don't see it because it, it moves with, uh, may, may say, velocity faster than we can catch. Suppose it, it moves uh, in this velocity and we actually saw it. So we call, we have aliasing. An example of this aliasing, 
if you look at the fan, ceiling fan, and uh, if the ceiling fan is good enough and it, it, it rotates at very high speed, at certain point you will see that, or you, you, your eye will tell you that, uh, that the, the fan is moving in, in the reverse direction. It, if it, it, rever it rotates in this direction, at some time, due to a high speed of the fan, you may have misrepresentation of this rotation and see that the fan is moving in reverse direction with less speed. Sometimes you, 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 you see this also in some Western movies, if you, look at, if you watch uh, American movies, especially the, the era of Western, also they, uh, uh, they uh, make uh, clips for the movie of the wheel, the, the car uh, uh, wheel, and then also aliasing up here. In seismic, aliasing looks like this example, something like this example. So suppose I, am, I have this signal and I want to digitize at these intervals. So here, this point is zero. This point is, say, minus one. This point, say, is minus point one. And this is uh, point two. So the result will be something like that. So the digitized signal, so the digitized signal I have will be completely different than the original one. And thus I'm saying it's aliased. Uh, I won't say thank you, but not, so, not that uh, speed. <laughs> Not that fast. So uh, may, maybe the, the reflection, the reflectors uh, will be uh, removed. Uh, maybe useful information will be uh, removed. Some artificial, not, not realistic data will be entered to my data. So in this case, at the discretization, I have first to define the Nyquist frequency for the sampling rate I'm looking for, and then apply ant alias filter, which means that apply ant alias fil filter to remove all, frequency, all frequencies above the Nyquist frequency. So if I'm going to uh, use 100 sample per second, so I will apply ant alias filter at the discretization stage to remove all frequencies above 50 hertz. Okay? Uh, in this sense, uh, uh, anti-alias filter is not, it's not alias filter. Anti-alias filter is uh, high cut or low bus. Okay? High cut or low bus filter. Okay, now I can say thank you.